Andy Quantz here with a creative hand, getting ready to go into the studio. It's Easter Monday. Thank you, Jesus. Hi there, everybody. It's Randy here with a creative hand. I thought I'd give you an idea about what it takes to pull together a painting. Uh, I want to do this on a panel. And the panel that I'm choosing to use is a, an 8x10. This is a hardboard panel. I think uh, back in the 50s, it probably would have been called Masonite, but I don't think that brand name is used anymore. So this is just a hardboard panel that you could probably pick up at any of the home improvement stores. And they can cut it for you if you... Uh, tell them the size you need it to be, but you got to be careful. They may not cut it exactly to size, so you may have to do some planing or somehow finish it so that it will fit in a standard frame. Uh, so you have to make sure that uh, you get it cut to exactly 8 by 10 and uh, I think one of the other artists on YouTube will say if you slip them an extra little bit of money that they'll make sure that they get it cut exactly. So that's up to you unless you don't have some uh, hand tools that could trim just a little bit. That might be something you may want to consider. So we start with a plain uh, panel. This one, as you can see, is roughly eighth, an eighth of an inch. The first thing I do is do a, a priming, and um, it's just a, a, a white primer as a barrier between the oil paint and the, and the raw material. So we use a primer, and I, I use two different ones. Um, this surface is standard acrylic gesso. It's been around since the 50s. It's basically um, white latex house paint that's nothing great. So what I like to do is on the side on which I'll be painting, I put an oil-based primer and I can put a link to the, to the primer that I'm using. In that primer, I will mix some marble dust and it gives just the most beautiful finish um, that is just perfect for oil paint. So that's what I've done uh, with these panels. And uh, what, what you're looking at here is the back. So this is the acrylic gesso. On the other side, I, I prime it with the oil-based primer and then use uh, one of my uh, oil paints. The one that you're looking at here is raw umber. Some people like to use burnt umber. Uh, the, uh, the, the natural earth type pigments tend to be better in that they will dry or set up hard more quickly so that you can work on top of it. So I use a mixture with the oil paint. I just put it in a separate jar, a mixture of linseed oil and an odorless mineral spirit. This is a, a, a solvent that would replace traditional turpentine um, originally, when oil painting was new, turpentine was used, but it, it's a very toxic uh, solvent. So this by far is the best of the odorless mineral spirits. So I've mixed these two together. This is a, an oil cutter so that the paint will flow more li like liquid. Uh, but because it's a cutter, you need to put another binder back into it. And this is linseed oil, which is typical with most oil paints. Linseed oil mixed with this will create a very thin 
what's called a, a medium that you can use to modify your paint so that it can go on very thinly. And I just mix it inside this jar. Uh, inside this jar is a, is a, a cap from a, an old paint tube. I use that as an agitator so that it really thoroughly mixes the solution. And once I get that in, in, on my palette, then I'll, I'll take a stiff bristle brush and just scrub it into the surface. And once I've got that pretty well coated and it's beginning to set, I'll take a rag and just kind of rub it down, smooth it in, or let the paint uh, be blotted out on my brush and just keep working it in. And it, it gives a really beautiful finish. You notice that all of the brush work from the priming, I find that to be very pleasing. And uh, I think it gives a beautiful finish on the paintings, uh, even after they've been painted. It, 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 it gives it a texture that I think is very pleasing. You'll notice that there are two lines. I've done a simple grid um, so that I can do a transfer of my photograph onto my board. And it just helps me locate the lines a little more easily. Um, I use, gra I don't like to use graphite. Graphite is <clears throat> a type of a material that you will often sometimes see used for locks. It's a slippery kind of substance. And because of that, I, I prefer charcoal. That's what I've used here and what I've used in my drawing. I think charcoal is a more sympathetic uh, material because it is more like a raw pigment that might be used in oil paint. And so I, I, do, my, I do my gridding and my drawing with graphite. So I've taken a photograph and converted it to black and white. That's what this is. And I've also indicated those same grid marks so that once it's time for me to transfer it to my board, I've got something that gives me a little more control in my drawing. I've also used this as my source photo. Um, it's small, obviously, but it will give me the color references that I'll need. And I'll be using this mostly for placement and for uh, a value study, meaning what is for value from white to black and shades of gray in between. It'll, it'll help me um, get this more accurately rendered once I am ready to put paint on the surface. So once I've got my grid in place, I'll do a, a, a charcoal drawing, which is what we have here, and it shows all of the elements in place so that when it's time for me to begin my actual application of paint, I've got uh, landmarks from which to okay, work. So now I want us to talk about the paint that I'm gonna be using for the painting. Not so much the paint, but the pigments, the colors that I'm gonna be using. So I'm gonna switch uh, the camera around so that you can see my palette. It's not necessarily lighter to darker, but how they, how they live on the color wheel. What is their hue name on the color wheel? So it's cadmium yellow light, yellow ochre, burnt umber, cadmium red light. This is burnt sienna. This is dioxazine purple. This is ultramarine blue, and this is phthalo blue. And I've 
put that next to the photograph just to kind of give you a reference for the reason why I've chosen those colors. If you notice, this really dark that's here that kind of looks like a black, I've put out the ultramarine blue and the burnt umber. That will make, that mixing those two together will make an incredibly beautiful black that I can shift ever so slightly more toward the bluish color notes and then warm them up where I need to. And you notice I don't have any green tube colors. Greens are by far the most easily mixed of all the colors. And I've got a really bright yellow here and a very um, high chroma blue here. And with adding white, I'll be able to get some of those beautiful bluish greens here. And then by going with maybe some burnt umber and the yellow ochre along with that, we'll be able to get some of those nice, rich, uh, yellowy kind of greens there. And then I'm using this really hot orange plus white will get me that uh, kind of a peachy red color. And then of course this cadmium yellow light will hit some of those other yellow color notes that are there. I'm gonna begin doing a little bit of painting. And first I'm gonna give you a little heads up about the why behind my method. Um, this is that linseed oil and solvent mixture. And the underpainting, the toned can, uh, panel is toned with this mixture. And the, the underpainting, the paint that the, is the first layer that goes down should really be, be done with this as well. It is by far will be the most lean of all of the paint layers. And will adhere best to this. Uh, so, so I'm gonna cover all of my areas of the panel, first layer, with this as my medium. Now, uh, because odorless mineral spirit is toxic to breathe, I wanna just rest the lid on top. I won't screw it down. Uh, it's just that you don't want these vapors to uh, come out. Uh, it's a toxic substance and uh, everything that evaporates, I breathe. Uh, thankfully, we have really tall ceilings in here. I've brought in plants and uh, it helps to uh, purify the air to some extent. But um, I'm going to try to keep my lid on this as much as possible. Try to use a minimal amount of this medium. I'm going to begin by taking my brush. I'm going to use two brushes, a, a brush for darks and a brush for lights. That way I can kind of work on both at the same time. I've pre-mixed that dark that I was telling you about, burnt umber and ultramarine blue. And that's what this mixture is here. Some is a little more blue, uh, some is a little more brown. And then I've made some lighter value grays down here. And I'll just kind of intermix as I go. So I'm going to begin by dipping my brush into the solvent and try to find some of the darkest areas in the painting. I think up here is a very dark area. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in right here. The goal is to just kind of indicate where are my darkest darks and where are my lightest lights. So I'm just going to go ahead and kind of dance around the painting until I can put in all of these really dark darks and uh, come back and uh, do, do more later. I've roughly indicated areas where there are darks and have left areas that are not as dark and have in many ways just left a rough road map for where 
my next step is going to be. And what I think I'm going to do now is instead of approaching it from the darkest end, I'm going to go from the lightest areas and they, the white I'm going to paint will show up because this is obviously not white. So white paint, when I put it on this toned part of the panel will show up and that will leave some of those middle range values to be kind of those colors there. So uh, the next stage will be my putting in the white, the lightest parts of the values that are represented in this black and white study. I, I may begin to introduce some color also, but at this stage, it's mostly trying to reproduce a value study so that at some point later, I can begin to introduce color from these, um, from, from the original photograph. Notice how when I sent this photograph to a local drugstore's uh, film processing, well, it's not film, but um, to get a photograph made, I, I cropped it the way I had wanted it, but you, you cannot rely on what uh, an inexpensive photo uh, source will give you because in, in their software on their website, I, I cropped it like this. But notice how this part right here is this part right here. Do you see how, no matter how you choose in their software, because they have to reach a certain price point, what you get in a, a, a drugstore uh, photo uh, source is oftentimes not going to be what you expect. So my recommendation is to use a photograph from an inexpensive source like that as just your source for uh, data relating to hue and how strong or how weak the color might be, and then work from a, a black and white value study. That will give you a much more accurate representation of the cropping and the layout that you're choosing for your painting. I've um, added some color, I've added some greens, and I put in those white color notes so that I have a, a range now of my darker darks as opposed to my lighter lights. Uh, clearly they're not as saturated as they need to be, but um, it, it's, it's on its way. And I have begun uh, adding my greens by choosing to use the um, phthalo blue, which is a really high chroma, almost bluish green color, yellow ochre. I've used almost all of it and have begun to increase the chroma, which is the, the vividness of the color by adding uh, cadmium yellow light. So that's what this color is here. I've up to this point been using these two brushes. They're uh, bristle brushes, uh, hog's hair bristle. And now I've switched to what's a, called a synthetic bristle. It's a smoother brush and has allowed me to get in some finer lines. And uh, at this stage, I'm probably gonna switch from the bristle brushes to the um, synthetic bristle. Uh, now that I've added the yellow or green notes below. I'm going to switch and try to add uh, the bluer greens that are above. I'm going to hold off on painting the, the, the vivid orange peach colors and the bright yellows because if, if I try to hit those, um, I'm, I'm concerned that as I brush against the, 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 the dark that I've 
painted, I'll end up with really uh, a gray. And I don't want a gray. I want a very hot, bright, uh, high intensity color for these, uh, these yellow peach colored leaves. So I'm going to just paint a little while and try to work on hitting these, um, these bluish green colors. I'm uh, gonna squeeze out a little bit more of this um, th phthalo blue, phthalo cyanine is really more of a, a dye than it is a, a, a pigment. It's a, it's a newer uh, pigment that uh, I don't know when it was, was introduced, but it's certainly not as old as the more purple uh, French ultramarine. Originally, French ultramarine was uh, ground up lapis lazuli. And so uh, back in the day, it was a very pricey pigment and uh, would have been used very sparingly. So here I'm using the, uh, the, the medium that is a mixture of linseed oil and solvent and I'm blotting onto my rag so that it's not so wet. And I'm gonna go into this thalo and try to hit that, that value and hue of the leaves that are up above. So I'm actually holding it up and over uh, those leaves and that's what this is right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and just paint that in. It looks very blue, but it really, it really is if you compare it with uh, what you see. And do you see how getting close to that black pulled some of that in? So I'm gonna go down to the palette and kind of offload so that I can go back and, and reestablish that nice bright color and I'll wait until I've gotten most of that color indicated and then go, go back and um, paint that in on the edges. I'm, I'm searching for areas where that color is its most saturated and I'm, I'm gonna put it in there once again, I'm always comparing. I want to, um, that's some kind of stick. I'm just gonna pull down. Um, this is up here. And I'm, I'm really just kind of putting, putting it into to place um, in areas that I see it. Uh, back here over that stick is some of that. It's a little darker, so I'm gonna allow it to mix with the um, dark color that I, I pre-painted. And you can, you can see how it's, I'm just, I'm just dabbing it around. These two little dots right there are these two little dots right here. And they're very pale. They're very, they're very, very pale and very blue. So I'm gonna go ahead and plop those in. And there's another one right there and it's even whiter. So I'm just gonna load with white and see if I can plop that in. I'm just gonna twist it. Oops. And just keep looking for areas that have a similar value. That's another very light and blue note right there. Phthalo is a very, very strong tinting color. Um, so I'm gonna use uh, it very lightly and um, allow it to blend. See, that's very strong with just that little bit that was on my brush. So I'm gonna compare 
<coughs> excuse me. So that is this part right here. And that looks like it might be a little too strong. So for the other two little marks, I'm just gonna kind of gently tickle those in. Um, I'm seeing other areas where it could be that light color. So I'm gonna go back and put that in where I see those really pale, there's a really pale stroke of color up there. Go back and get some, some white and add to it. Uh, up here is a little bit more. Um, and just, I'm just dancing around looking for other areas it's, I'm trying to reference this for my hue and my color, and this is my value range. And so this really stops like right there because that little thing right there is that right there. And so there's a little bit of lightness there. That's too strong. And there's another little tickle of, of light that's coming down here and off to the side of that. That's still too strong. So I'm just gonna stop jabbering and just and just paint. Um, and hopefully you'll you'll be seeing what what I'm I'm doing as I as I progress. The color of green in this background is a little darker and greener. So I'm going to go back and get some of that darker green if you notice right there. So the 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 thing to to watch out for is to um, paint the color that you see, not the color that you, you think you see. And I know that that's, that's difficult to do, but un until you get paint on your, uh, your surface, it's, it's gonna be difficult to, uh, to, to really and truly uh, figure out what, what it is you're actually looking at. And uh, some of these darks that are up there, I painted kind of lightly and um, because I knew that I would be going back over them and they're not very high chroma colors. So mixing with this still wet paint film uh, will, will help me to let some of that fall back, meaning even if I have a lighter color on my brush, um, it will it will mix and and still read as a as a green color. And I have a little uh, device here. I call it a mall stick, but really this is supposed to be what is attached to the you you rest it on your surface. But I found this very useful. It's just a, an extended uh, wand that I have attached to a nail and it uh, allows me to just let it drop and it, it works really quite well. So it helps me to get a little more control when I wanna zero in on something, kind of a darkish green color right there. Put that in and uh, just kind of paint the negative space, paint things that are not um, the leaves or the stems so that when it comes time to actually paint those things, then um, they'll show up.
painting, if you, if you paint something that isn't the thing, then you've painted the thing, if that makes any sense. All of this over here is a little more of a yellow green, so I'll go down here to this dark but still yellow green and kind of fill that in um, down here, the far side of, it's, it's, it's hard to, to see what, 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 what you're painting if you're looking between two things, but that's just, that's just part of the, of the deal. You got to kind of, um, look at, at what you're painting and, and just try to, try to get it in there. Over here, this one is very yellow. I'm going to blue it up a little bit down here. So, so this is a very dark note and I left it kind of unpainted up to this point. So I'm going to go get some darker green that happens to be more of a yellow color. And I'm going to, so here's, here's the center line and here's what's left over. You can barely see it. So I know that it falls in there and I'm just going to kind of place it. And these, these greens are very much the same hue, which means they're that, that green that has a little more blue in it. But you can, you can bridge hue across different hues if you know the 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 combo to to go to this is it's a little bluer so now i'm going to go lighter and a little bluer to try to hit that hue and value and basically i'm just I'm just gonna kind of hypnotize that a little bit so that it's not so strong. And down here, this, this twig is, so I'm, I'm trying not to put paint on a surface that, uh, that, that black paint on a surface that, that doesn't need it because it's, it's, a, it's a graying color. So being able to paint on top of something that um, doesn't have that black in it can be very helpful. And there, there comes a time when uh, the paint becomes overly dry and, and you, can, you can actually indicate things that you couldn't while the paint was overly wet. So if you see how that how that whole thing is is working, it 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 helps. Now that is a very clear, not green note. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to figure out a way to I might even leave it that that color. So here here's a spot that I haven't painted and it's that same dark green color. So I'm gonna paint that there and it just has to be an indication it doesn't it doesn't have to be perfect sometimes you can you can define the shape a little more carefully by just doing that so I'm thinking that that's a little leaf underneath that bigger leaf and so now I'm gonna connect all that and then go back and get some really dark paint and do that back side of that and get my black brush and paint this dark edge here and pull that down and over it's really dark down here 
The thing, the thing that is hard at this stage is with this bristle brush, it, it's, it's a kind of a scratchy kind of brush where this is a very smooth brush. You don't, you're not pulling uh, paint off of the surface. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a dance. That's that little bit right there. And it looks like it might be coming over. There's a tip that comes out. It's a little overkill, but we can go back and, and smooth that back. You're not supposed to paint with your fingers, but obviously I do. And sometimes I have to remind to breathe because when you're in the, in the middle of painting, you want to be careful and <laughs> find myself holding, holding my breath. I, I, I don't recommend that, but if you hear me sigh, that, that's... <laughs> that, <laughs> that's that's what's going on. So this up here is dark, and that's this part right here, but it needs to be green, and I'm just gonna throw some green in there and just let it kind of blend. There's a gray thing here. I wonder if that's a, a gray leaf that's folded back on itself. I'll I'll need to decide on that probably later once I've got more paint into place. So I'm going to stop for now and um, continue painting. And as you can see, I've really uh, fairly well established the warmer green colors down at the bottom and the cooler green colors up at the top, like it is showing here. And the reason I left the leaf shapes open, uh, you can almost sense that they represent very well those warmer color notes of the actual hue that is in the photograph. So the next time I begin painting, I'll be able to hit those really bright uh, but, but, but subtle uh, light colors. And this, uh, this beige, uh, color that's underneath will help with that. I'll reestablish the whites and uh, I'll reestablish the darks. I probably won't use, um, I, well, I'll probably use that medium for the, the, the peachy yellow leaf colors, but everywhere else I'll switch to a, a different medium that is uh, less toxic. It's uh, solvent free. I'm planning to do the final parts here of the painting. As you can see, I've moved my reference information to the left so we can get a bigger view of the painting itself. And my goal is to begin painting the yellow and I'm gonna carve back this opening. I've made it a little too large so I wanna carve it back with the yellow and then begin to insert yellow where I see it. And it, it appears ever so slightly that there's a little rosiness here. So I'm going to use some of that bright orange color on my palette. The name of that pigment is um, Cadmium Red Light with uh, white paint and uh, just ever so slightly hint that rosiness there um, in a kind of gradation way. I'm also going to indicate the gray twig elements and then later we'll pump up the extreme darks and the extreme whites I don't know if you can see that the white did not fully cover 
in all these areas. So my plan is to um, add another hit of white over this. Uh, the paint has set up uh, now so that it's it the 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 solvent and the linseed oil mixture have done their job. They have sped up the drying of the paint film. It's not really drying. What what has happened is the oil in the pigment uh, oxidizes and actually changes its chemical composition from an oil-based product to uh, a polymer, to a, a type of a plastic. And so uh, that, that has happened, uh, not so much with the white. Of all the pigments, white is one of the uh, slowest of all to harden. And I drug my finger over that and uh, ended up smearing that that passage right there as I drug my finger over it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna begin by painting the the yellow elements and then switch to the to that beautiful peach color and uh, we'll we'll see how it goes. I'm going to um, make my first strokes here trying to uh, carve back that 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 shape and uh, then I'll I'll go on to the next step I have pretty well indicated all of the peachy yellow e leaves and uh, went back and restated some of the darks, fine-tuned some of the leaf shapes. So really all that's left at this point is these little sketchy twigs that are visible here. I'd like to make them a little more connected and defined in the proper hue. Um, they're in the original toned panel color, which is that um, raw umber based color. So I want, I want to convert them more to a cool gray. And then also at this point, I, I want to look at the painting overall and make some decisions. Um, down here below, there are ye more yellowy kind of greens and up above are the more blue kind of greens. And if, if I think about the color wheel as a way to get these to really jump out more, uh, opposite yellow on the color wheel is purple, opposite red or orange on the color wheel is blue. So if I really wanted to push the hue of these yellow peachy leaves, I'll want to steer some of this up in here more toward a purpley blue color, which I'm considering. And I'm not saying I'm gonna make blue and purple leaves, but what I am saying is I can shift some of these darks more toward uh, a bluish purple. And uh, I, I, I may do that, but that's something that um, I'm considering and it may happen, it may not. But anyway, I wanted um, to give you a window into the progression of uh, these final leaves. So I hope, uh, hope this is making sense for you. Okay, well, I'm believing that this is where I'm gonna call it done. I pray that this has been something that has been a blessing to you, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next time when maybe we can paint together again. Bye.